We're going to move along to Yolanda Chen, who has a, um, she's actually with the University of Vermont, and she has a project on determining the feasibility of pheromone mating disruption for managing Swede medge damage. And this is an ARDP project and a Northeast SARE project. So Yolanda, go ahead. Hi, Steve. I hope everybody can hear me. Yep, sounds um, great. Okay, so thanks, Christy, um, for the nice introduction on Swede Midge. I hope everybody was able to uh, get a sense to, in terms of the extent in which Swede Midge is really very truly damaging, especially for small scale um, growers and then also organic growers. Um, so because of this need and, and because we've already had reports of 100% losses for organic broccoli, uh, we've been focusing on trying to identify uh, pest management um, uh, solutions for this growing um, uh, invasive species. So we have been looking into the possibility of developing a pheromone mating disruption program for Swede midge. Uh, and one of the biggest uh, challenges um, is that we are developing something like this for an annual crop and kind of the convention um, is that typically pheromone mating disruption programs are developed for uh, perennial crops. And here we're dealing with something that is rotated um, uh, every season uh, in order to manage many of the other pests and diseases. Uh, so my grad student, Elizabeth Hodgson, has been working on uh, the pheromone um, along with her collaborator, Rebecca Hallett. Uh, and also Christy Hopding is also a, a collaborator on this grant. Uh, next slide, please. So, so what we have found is that Swede midge is highly damaging. Uh, basically, the larvae uh, is exuding um, some sort of a kind of um, liquid substance that we believe that the brassica plant itself reacts to, which uh, causes distortions and growth, and then also the possibility of a complete loss of the head. And what we've found is that by applying the larvae on the head, or the developing meristem, as few as three larvae can lead to a loss um, of this bra brassica head. Um, and so that is why we are focusing on developing approaches that will prevent females from laying eggs on the plant. Um, and so we're working on both pheromones in terms of pheromone mating disruption, and then also we're interested in looking at repellency and different types of repellents. Next slide, please. Uh, so one of the main challenges uh, for working with Swede midge is that diptera in general have much more complex pheromone um, components. So typically most of the programs, the really successful programs for widespread area-wide management uh, using pheromone mating disruption has been with LEPs. And for Lepidopteran pheromones, they're very simple straight chain carbon molecules. Whereas with Swede midge and many of the fly co components, uh, there's also an issue around chirality, which is basically chirality is if you have um, additions onto um, a compound, it matters in terms of which angle or which side um, of the bond the, the compound, um, the additional side chain is added to. And so fly compounds tend to be very, very expensive. Um, we had a quote initially for um, our particular um, grant, uh, we were asking for about a, a kilogram of pheromone compounds, and the cost was gonna be about $250,000. Uh, and so we have a lot of concerns as to whether something as expensive as a fly pheromone could actually be used for commercial purposes. So we've been um, interested in looking at different types of blends, including blends that um, have compounds that are mixed uh, in terms of the cis and trans uh, components. And um, so we're looking at whether these particular blends are attractive to the males. And then we're also looking at whether these compounds themselves can actually prevent male uh, mate location and also mating. Next slide, please. So, so far we have been doing uh, behavioral trials and then we have some field trials. What we found in the lab is that males were actually attracted to both the natural blend, which is what 
the females are naturally producing, and then natural racemic blends, which are basically the blended components that have both the cis and trans components added to it. So it's a blend and it's cheaper actually to manufacture chemically. And so the males were uh, didn't really differentiate it between these blends in that they were um, both they were both attractive. And what we found when we did behavioral assays is that they did not actually mate with females um, under any of these blends. So that's good news because the natural racemic and the racemic blends are the, the cheaper um, blends that may have um, hope for commercial use. Whereas the natural blend would be way too expensive for growers to actually use. Next slide, please. So we also use these particular blends in the field and um, this midge actually was first detected in Ontario and that's where the, the populations are highest and the levels of damage are the highest. Um, there have been accounts of uh, growers uh, throughout the kind of current invaded range that have decided that they need to move away from brassicas just because it's economically unfeasible to, to grow the crops. And a lot of it is because the foliar insecticides that growers typically want to use do not actually uh, reach the midge where it's found between the, the leaves of the bud. So what we found is that in the field, the pheromone um, for both the natural blend and the racemic blend. And so we were releasing these at kind of um, high levels. So estimates as to a thousand times what a typical female would produce. So when we were releasing this in the field, we actually saw pheromone trap um, shut down. And this means that the pheromone traps that we're using to actually monitor the fields were not able to collect any more males suggesting that the, f the field releases of the pheromone levels were high enough that the males could then detect um, the traps themselves. And what we found um, using um, um, these traps is that more males were found in the control plots overall, and then also we were unable to really um, dif differentiate greatly between the natural um, and the racemic blends for the pheromone. Next slide, please. Um, so at this point, this is a work in progress. We have, um, this is a four year project and we are basically uh, just completed our first field season. Um, so we have um, um, thankfully some support from both the US government and also from Ontario um, and also currently from the state of Vermont. So thank you all for your attention. Next slide, please. Great, thank you. Uh, so, so Yolanda, we're going to have to move to the next speaker. Again, I appreciate your talk, and as I would encourage other folks, there's a chat box uh, to ask specific questions, and also these individuals can be contacted outside of this uh, uh, session or this conference. So, we're now going to hear from uh, Donna Falk, uh, who's with Penn State University, and she's going to talk to us about managing equine resistant parasites using a whole farm approach. And this is a Northeast SARE project. So Donna, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I feel like um, this is a totally different uh, subject area than, than I've been hearing a lot about. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit background information. So if I can have the next slide. I guess the one thing that um, is, was important in our study is that we, we did know a lot um, when we started this. We knew that there was a looming crisis um, for the equine industry because parasites have become very resistant to the products that are available to the industry. We know that in the 1960s and in the 80s, there were new dewormers that were developed with a recommendation to deworm horses every eight weeks. And our horse clientele really bought into that recommendation and continued to deworm horses every eight weeks. Uh, the, the parasite of concern in the past was the large strongyle. It was a very dangerous parasite. It was large, it migrated through arteries, went into different organs in the horse's body and was capable of causing death. And with the advent of these new products, we have virtually eliminated the large strongyle and the small strongyle has now become the parasite of, of concern. It has a very short reproductive cycle. Resistance is being reported throughout the world. 
to many of the products that were developed in the 1960s and the 1980s. We know that that's an inherited trait. We know that if horse owners continue to deworm horses using the present strategy that they employ, that very quickly we will have products that are, are no longer available to deworm horses. Next slide. Okay, so we have a new protocol. Because we've learned so much, we've realized that there are other strategies that we can use. We know that small strongyles have, uh, horses have great immunity for the most part to small strongyles and oftentimes don't need to be dewormed. We know that there are some horses that for whatever reason do not have immunity and are responsible for putting a lot of the eggs out in the pastures that, that we're dealing that will mature into adult worms and create problems for our horses. So our new protocol, protocol is to use products that we know work, to administer them at the appropriate time of the year. And the most important thing is to deworm those horses based on the burden that they have, treating them as individuals, not as a herd. Okay, next question, next um, slide. Okay, so why, why do we need a, a, a project? I mean, we already have the tools that we need to at least slow down the rate at which resistance occurs. And this is really why. One of our consultants is from the University of Kentucky. His name is Dr. Martin Nielsen. And um, this statement kind of sums it up. He says that now, by now, virtually every equine veterinarian in the country knows that regularly scheduled across the board deworming is a bad idea. And then of course people know that also. But how many people have acted on this information and changed their approach to parasite control? Not nearly enough. The information has been out there for a long period of time. We know that many of these products are not working. Horse owners continue to use products that do not work. And because they care about their horses, they continue to deworm every eight weeks. All right, next slide. So our goal is somewhat different. Our goal was to empower, empower farm managers to make changes. What we wanted to see is if we could make our farm owners adopt this new protocol and actually change what they're doing, because that has been the challenge and that, was, that is what has not been happening. So our biggest goal was to try to make horse owners have confidence in the surveillance-based method methodology and make changes to their program. And our second uh, goal was to document the levels of parasite burdens that we actually have in Pennsylvania and determine which products are no longer um, working on our, on our farms. So we felt that to make changes, people have to have a lot of knowledge, they have to feel comfortable. So we developed a short course, which we moved around the state of Pennsylvania, called Reducing Parasite Resistant Using a Whole Farm Approach. We talked about parasite behavior. It was very intensive, entire day short course. We talked about types of parasites, resistance, product development, which is not happening at the present. We talked about the effects of pasture management, manure management on uh, reducing parasite loads. We had 287 farm managers actually attend, um, attend the short course. We're in our third year of the grant. This is the results from the second year. I mean, actually we're in our second year. So we've got one more year to go. Next slide. Okay, this most important thing that we did is we felt that just having a veterinarian conduct a fecal egg count wasn't enough. It was too impersonal. It didn't give the farm owners enough information. It was expensive. Uh, we've heard prices of $25 to $45 of horse per sample. And when farms need to sample horses multiple times throughout the grazing season, it becomes price prohibitive. So what we, we organized is we called them our manure parties. We invited farm managers that had attended the short course to meet with us on a regular scheduled basis. And they monitored the egg production in their horses, identified those horses that were high shedders and needed to be treated differently, and then evaluated the products that we gave them to use on their high shedder, shedders to see if they were still working on their farm. We supplied the microscopes using the SARE grant. We supplied the uh, materials that they needed to do the fecal egg counts, and our farm partners met with us every week, every eight weeks at three determined, determined sites with all the manure in tow um, to conduct the fecal egg counts. Next slide. 
Okay, so um, our goal was 80 farms and we're amazed to see that we met that the second year of our study. We're continuing this during the third year. That represented 732 horses in 19 counties in Pennsylvania. These people conducted egg counts every eight weeks starting in March. And then they dewormed their horses that had high counts using the products that we gave them, came back two weeks later and looked at the reduction in egg shedding to determine if the products were still working on the farms. Next slide. Okay, so what we found so far, one surprise we had is Pyrantel, we knew was not working very well in Kentucky and farms in the South. We felt it would work fairly well in Pennsylvania. We found that 43% of the farms are showing resistance and an additional 26% we suspect has developing resistance on the farm. Fenbendazole, 86% uh, of the farms had parasites that were resistant to that product. There's very little likelihood that that's gonna work on many of the farms in Pennsylvania. Ivermectin is still working, but we have a second part of this project that we just started where we're looking at egg reappearance time and we're finding that we're seeing um, egg reappearance time that's um, at a much shorter interval than it should be indicating that we probably have resistance to Ivermectin starting as well. Okay, next slide. Okay, so we evaluated our farm partners to see what they thought of the project and what they were able to do because of this project. We found that 100% of them were able to identify high shedders. 95% were able to identify their horses with good immunity for small strungiles that probably did not need to be dewormed. 95% were able to identify products that were no longer viable on their farms. And it was amazing to us that 81% of the, the farm partners actually reduced their use of dewormers, which was our goal. And we, we definitely met that goal. 100% reported that they now have confidence in this method. They've read about it, they never used it, but because they're doing it themselves, they're getting the data themselves, they're learning how to use it, they have confidence in it, and they plan to continue it after our project is over. And they even have called us because they want to buy their own microscopes and set up these surveillance-based methods on their own farm. 68% are improving their pastures to reduce parasite exposure. 45% are removing manure from their pastures. And one of the amazing things to us is we weren't sure people were going to complete this. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of manure to collect. It's messy. They have to drive to our sites. And yet we had 97% of our farm partners complete the entire project with us. They've truly become um, people that we know very, very well. So, so, so Donna, I hope that's the last okay. week. Okay. We're, unfortunately, we're gonna have to switch. I know you've got some really good information and I, I appreciate it, but we've yeah. got three more speakers. So um, we're gonna have to move to our next presentation. Uh, unfortunately, it's just the way our things are going, but uh, we're going to move to uh, Sue Souffle from the UMass, uh, sorry, uh, yes, UMass Cooperative Extension, and she's looking at pepper weevil pathways in New Jersey, and this is a Northeastern SARE funded project, so Sue, go ahead. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes. They sound good. So I'm not going to talk about pepper weevil at all, actually. I'm going to talk to you about my SARE partnership project on um, controlling diseases of spinach in winter systems. Um, so this was a partnership grant with a local farmer here. Um, winter greens production is increasing um, in New England, as many of you probably know. Um, and this is a grower who uh, winter greens are one of her primary sources of income, farm income. Uh, and the uh, the way that they do it is they seed spinach or other greens in September or early October, and the plants grow throughout the winter, and they they cut the spinach multiple times, and then it regrows. Um, and then at the end of the winter season, they'll take all the spinach out and plant something like tomatoes or melons or peppers, and the tunnels really never get a break uh, in production and so what happens is you're building up pathogens in the soil there um, and those could be 
you know, generalist pathogens like damping off Pythium, Phytophthora, and Rhizoctonia, um, or pathogens specific to spinach and other greens. Um, so we see a lot of Cercospora leaf spot and Cladosporium leaf spot as well. Um, so our goal here with this project was to look at um, what commercially available organic approved uh, biological fungicides are out there to improve stands and uh, quality of leafy greens. Um, so we basically did uh, a field trial in this uh, grower's tunnel here um, and also did a, a lab assay to look at different biological fungicides, the organisms um, in the lab and see if any of them grew better at low temperature. Um, this, these are unheated high tunnels, so they do freeze throughout, throughout the winter. So next slide. So in the field trial, uh, we were just again looking at efficacy of available biofungicides. Um, so here's a list of the treatments that we had. Um, these are bacteria, um, bacillus and streptomyces species, or in the case of root shield, plus um, there's trichoderma, two trichoderma fungi. So um, we sprayed the spinach uh, at seeding and then um, made multiple follow-up applications throughout the course of the growing season between October and March of the next year, um, depending on the uh, recommendations from the label. Um, you can see here, usually I show this slide at the end, but um, the, there's a really uh, big difference in the cost of these different treatment programs. Um, next slide. So we rated um, the germination and plant stand as well as vigor. Um, we didn't end up seeing any of the leaf spot diseases this year. Um, we did in the pictures here, you can see that there is um, a lot of patchiness in these plots and that's associated at least in part with um, damping off pre and post emergence damping off. Um, so unfortunately what we found was that none of these materials um, really significantly improved plant stand or um, vigor or yield in the end. At the second time point here, the 20th of October, um, the, the, there were significant differences here in uh, stand with mica stop and the root shield plus oxidate treatment performing statistically better than the untreated control. Um, next slide, please. Um, so that was sort of um, not what we would hope to see, um, no differences in the treatments, uh, but it's also, um, it's hard to see those uh, differences in the biological fungicides in the field. So it's not always surprising to have that result. Um, so we did look at growth of these organisms, biocontrol organisms in the lab over the winter. Um, so we grew the bacteria um, in liquid media um, or the fungi in the case of root shield on solid media um, and incubated them at different temperatures um, and, and just monitored their growth over time. So um, here we're looking at bacteria, growth of bacteria um, at different temperatures, and um, none of them grew very well at 50 degrees, except for mycostop, and at 43 degrees or 6 degrees C, um, none of them really grew at all except for, again, mycostop. And we repeated this once and saw similar results. Um, I'm not showing you here the results of the fungal assay 
Um, but suffice it to say that trichoderma grew at 50 degrees, um, though slowly, but it didn't grow at 43 degrees after 11 days. Uh, next slide. Um, so this was a one-year study. Um, as I described, none of the treatments significantly improved stand or yield of spinach. Um, most of the biocontrol organisms didn't grow very well at, um, at 50 degrees, and none of them grew at 43 degrees. Um, so what are kind of the take-home messages for growers? Um, if you remember that slide with the price uh, or the cost of these different treatment programs, um, root shield is really cheap and it, it only needs to be applied once every six weeks, I think. Um, and it was, it did grow at 50 degrees, so um, that might be one uh, economic option. Um, Microstop shows some promise where um, it did significantly improve stand um, right after seed germination um, and it performed better than a lot of the other um, bacterial biofungicides um, in the lab assay. Um, it was pretty expensive to use. Um, I think it was applied every two or every four weeks so if you if you used Microstop just in the early season to to get that improvement in stand, that might be a way to reduce the cost. Um, one thing we saw in the study was um, pictured here this leaf yellowing, um, and that was sort of interesting. We kept trying to figure out if it was a disease, and we um, isolated some fusarium species from the plants over and over again and so we did coax postulates but didn't see the same um, symptoms in a greenhouse assay. Um, so now we're um, investigating the possibility that um, this is a reaction to high salts accumulating in the soil and my colleague Katie is uh, working on that. Um, so I just put that out there in case anyone else is seen this around and might have some ideas. Great, thanks. Thanks. So we're going to have to go on to our next speaker. Really uh, interesting work you're doing. Uh, we've got two more speakers and I realize we're about 15 minutes over time, but if folks could just hang around, I think you'll uh, benefit from hearing from, uh, first of all, we're going to hear from Peter Yench. He's with Cornell University and his project is Managing Spotted Wing Drosophila Using Attract and Kill Stations in New York. And this is a Northeastern SARE funded project. So Peter, go ahead. Hi Steve, can you hear me? Uh, your, your volume's lo low. Let's see if I can do something about that. Is that any better? Yeah. All right, I'll try to get a little closer to the, uh, to the computer, I think. All right, well with that, uh, presentation does touch on some aspects of our track and kill work that we've been doing, try to develop uh, an economic and effective track and kill station. And for those of you unfamiliar with spotted wing Drosophila, it's sort of taken the world by storm, uh, showed up in California in 2008. And uh, the ability of the insect to migrate, build really high populations very quickly in fruit hosts, as well as uh, to, to just be able to move about the state and overwinter successfully, it appears. Uh, in part, all of that's due to this uh, sclerotinized and uh, serrated ovipositor in the bottom left-hand corner of this first slide. It's able to penetrate into uh, unripened fruit, and in so doing, it can occupy a non-competitive niche. The insect doesn't like competition very much, and so its success in part lies in the um, in its ability to, to do just that. Uh, so the goal of any attract and kill station really is to be able to uh, uh, really captivate the interest of a female, in this case, spotted wing Drosophila, gravid females, to outcompete the fruit so that it reduces the, uh, the overposition into, in this case, raspberries, as well as in, reduce the populations overall through mortality. So in our next slide, just show you the, uh, the the device itself, it's a three-inch disc on, um, 
uh, a substrate of uh, woven polypropylene, so you can change the slide. Um, we, the, the one before that actually shows you the disc. Uh, there it is. And we apply to the uh, netting, which acts as a base, a superabsorbent polymer. Now, superabsorbent polymer is used in uh, insectaries to be able to uh, provide insects with the moisture and not have them drown. It can absorb 60 to 100 times its weight in liquid. We add to that a gelatin, which acts uh, as a binder, as well as to reduce uh, weathering. And then we add a track to kill solution that's made up of three different components, the raspberry concentrate, cider vinegar, and brewer's yeast, which increases the volatile. So a track to kill station is basically the success of these things is really dependent on in this case, for spotted wing, olfactory and visual cues that create volatility. Um, the size, shape, and color of the attract and kill station is really critical to success. To that, uh, to, to these stations, uh, we apply two milliliters of the attract and kill solution along with an active ingredient. And so the next slide shows some of the lab studies. This is our, our one of our final laboratory studies that we conducted in order to make a decision on which active ingredient to use. So this slide shows three different active ingredients. Our standard had been in Trust SC, which is a spinosad product, um, the organic formulation of spinosad. And to that, we compared borax in a commercial formulation uh, versus just the active ingredient in a 99% um, uh, formulation. And you can see on the top bars that the red uh, bars represent mortality. Uh, using Entrust compared to Borax gives us between 90 and 95 percent mortality over a 48 hour period. So these were done inside of insect uh, tents, if you will, where we apply 25 adult uh, <clears throat> in a chamber with five um, red raspberries, organic red raspberries. So over 48 hours, we had high levels of mortality using these products. When we compared it to a disc alone without any active ingredient, we did find that uh, we retained the, uh, the spotted wing drosophila. We didn't see any mortality to speak of compared to the untreated controls. However, if you look at the bottom green bars, those represent the number of eggs per gram of raspberry weight. You can see that the untreated disc alone was able to distract, if you will, uh, the insect from ovipositing into the fruit, and thus it provide lower levels of infestation compared to untreated controls that just had uh, the flies, the raspberries, and water. So in our next slide, just wanted to, uh, to show you what we're doing in the field. Uh, the attracted kill stations then are applied uh, to three raspberry plantings on three farms in two counties, Ulster and Dutchess County this season. And we had one conventional planting in which conventional materials were used and two organic planting systems in which one had in trust applied at seven to 14 day intervals. And the third uh, site, the second organic plot, had completely unsprayed berries. So populations of spotter wing drosophila and conventional was low. In the sprayed, organic was medium, and in the unsprayed, we had very high levels of spotted wing drosophila adults. Each row represents a different uh, application date in which we hung the attract and kill stations. In the red plots, we hung them at 18 inches apart in a V pattern, so beginning at uh, the low canopy to the upper strata of the canopy, back down to the low part of the canopy, across the whole row on both sides. So we split the plot up in replicates one, two, and three. We came in with a weekly spray of the attractant kill stations using the attractant kill solution plus the active ingredient in the red treatments. And the red treatment had the, the discs spaced at one and a half feet. The yellow at three feet, both the yellow and red got 1% borax. But in the green plots, we didn't spray them at all season long. So this we did on those three different farms, and then the next site is our data. Um, having to go through this fairly quickly, if you look at the far right column, it's a combination of all three site data sets, and what we found was a statistical difference between the boric acid-treated discs and the untreated disc plots, 
as well as separation between those two kinds of discs, treated and untreated, compared to the untreated controls. So you can see in the boric acid space at 18 inches, we had about 69%, almost 70% reduction in overposition of field berries compared to boric acid um, on a weekly spray interval of about 62%. If you go down to the, to the second red circle from the top, we had boric acid at 18 inches compared to uh, boric acid at 36 inches, but sprayed twice a week. We really didn't see any difference of whether or not we spray it once or twice a week. So that was good news for us. The, good, the other uh, part of this that was really exciting was that the untreated disc itself, just being present in the field, reduce the amount of overposition we saw in red raspberries. So with that, um, we're going to be looking at what kind of behavioral changes are actually taking place in the adult flies in laboratory and field studies, and then canopy manipulation over the course of the season to try to increase the volatility and attractiveness of these stations uh, in, in both conventional and organic systems. Great, thank you, Peter, very interesting. We're having a, some technical difficulties on our end, but um, we're going to go to our next, our final speaker this morning, or now noon, uh, and Ashley Leach uh, from Cornell University is going to talk about optimizing soil fertility for managing onion thrips in onion, and this is a Northeastern SARE funded project. So Ashley, go ahead when you're ready. All right. Hi, everybody. I promise I'll make this short. I know it's close to lunchtime here. Um, so I'm just going to be briefly describing um, how we're looking at soil fertility as a potential cultural control to managing onion thrips and onion. Um, and if you could the slide. So specifically what we want to look at is we basically want to broaden the toolbox. So to give you a little bit of background, onion thrips are a significant pest of onion. They feed directly on onion leaves and severe infestations can actually lead to yield reductions upwards of 43% in some cases. Um, and the of it is that onion thrips also have a history of developing insecticide resistance. They've developed resistance to a variety of insecticides throughout the world and specifically here in the Northeast and in New York. Um, so there is a need to explore other non-chemical approaches to managing onion thrips, um, in, including uh, cultural controls. So advance the slide. Um, so what we're looking at in particular is fertility management. And the reason um, we're looking at this is because we know that there are two different soil amendments that have um, basically been shown to have this relationship with uh, onion thrips. Um, and specifically with nitrogen, we know that from previous thrips densities increase with increasing rates of nitrogen. Um, however, the reason we want to delve further into this is because we actually replicated this study in 2015 and in 2016 um, in Elvin, New York on a commercial onion farm. Um, and we actually found no difference of nitrogen rate. And we looked at three different rates of nitrogen, 60, 90, and 125 pounds of nitrogen applied at planting in the form of urea. And we found no um, effect on either onion thrips densities or on onion yield. So what we wanna do is we kind of wanna expand this project and ideally look at other um, additional rates and also looking at application timing. Um, and then we also wanna look at phosphorus. Um, because there is some literature that does support this idea that thrips densities do increase with increasing rates of phosphorus. Um, so if you could advance the slide. So our overall objective is to develop a fertility program that optimizes onion thrips control without compromising onion yield. Um, the hypothesis is that we believe that a split applied reduced rate of nitrogen will reduce onion thrips densities without compromising onion yield as compared to a standard nitrogen rate. And typically we're dealing with about 125 pounds or 100 pounds applied per acre um, as our standard nitrogen rate in uh, the Northeast. Um, and then our second hypothesis addressing our phosphorus is that we also believe that a reduced rate of phosphorus will also reduce onion and thrips densities without compromising onion yield as compared to a standard phosphorus rate. Um, and of course, this is going to be dependent on soil tests because um, it is going to differ uh, based on what our soil tests are. Um, so if you could please advance the slide. So in order to address these um, two hypotheses here, we have um, two trials that are going to be run in 2017 and 2018. They're going to be run in tandem or concurrently with one another. Um, and you can see here each number correlates to a different uh, nitrogen 
treatment. We've got four different rates of nitrogen we're looking at, 126, 94, 64, and then finally an unfertilized control. And we're looking at both pre-plant rates of these nitrogen as well as split applications of these um, nitrogen rates. Um, and then within each of these different treatments, there'll be a split plot design in which half receives insecticide and the other half um, does not receive insecticide in order to understand uh, the yield potential with these different treatments as well. Um, and this would be uh, organized in a randomized, completely replicated five times um, on a commercial onion farm on muck soil types. Um, if you could advance the slide. Um, and then quite a, a similar story regarding phosphorus. We're gonna be looking at four different rates of phosphorus, um, a high rate uh, of 25% reduction and a 50% reduction, and then finally an unfertilized control. And this of course will be dependent on soil types or our soil tests rather, um, and making sure that we're picking a soil that's gonna be somewhat deficient in phosphorus in order to truly test this. Um, once again, we're gonna have this split plot design in which we have insecticide applied to half and no insecticide applied half. Um, so the ultimate goal of this is to be able to create these recommendations that we can provide to onion growers at, that they can safely reduce of both phosphorus and nitrogen and ideally get a um, added benefit in reducing their onion thrips densities, but the bottom line is making sure not to also compromise yield. Um, so with that, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much for your time. Great, thank you, Ashley. Very interesting. Um, and uh, I think this is really a great example of the diversity of projects and research that's going on within the Northeast. And for those of you, if there's anyone watching from outside the Northeast, I think some of the things that you saw or heard could be applied in other regions. Um, and there's, you know, people working on livestock, people working in crops, people working in a lot of different you know, structural IPM and just really highlights where uh, pests occur. And I think that's really something that helps draw us all together, whether we're with an IPM center, whether with the Northeast SARE, whether with the ARDP program, anything that's working in pest has this kind of commonality. And I think that was highlighted today. So again, I wanna thank everyone for um, participating, you speakers. Thank you very much for sharing the information and the work that you're doing. And again, I'd like to remind folks that uh, we do have our partnership grant that's uh, currently out and encourage you to look at that. And we'll hopefully follow up with something similar to this in the spring on uh, toolbox of IPM methods. So be looking for that uh, this later on in the spring of next year. So again, thank you and we'll talk to you soon. <laughs>